Thank you very much for taking your time to uh, join us on this webinar on the Executable Research Article Project. My name is Emmy. I'm the Innovation Community Manager at eLife, and I'm very happy to be joined today, today by um, Alex, who is a designer and software engineer at Stencilla, and Anya, who is eLife's uh, marketing assistant, who will be helping us host the webinar today. So um, before we start, just uh, Again, hoping to bring your attention to the open agenda that we'd be following during this uh, webinar. Um, so uh, this serves the purpose of uh, letting you know the order of, of, of the events and also to, for you to be able to ask questions. So if you have questions during our presentations and demos, we uh, appreciate it if you could put the questions in the questions and answers section uh, that's towards the end of the open agenda. Um, or you can alternatively try and remember your question and uh, we'll have a dedicated Q&A section towards the end of this webinar um, where you'd be able to use the raise hand button in Zoom um, to be able to ask the question verbally. We'll be notified when you press that button and we'll be able to unmute you so you can ask your question. Alternatively, you can type your question into the Zoom webinar chat box um, so that we'd be able to see those questions and answer them. So I hope that is clear. Um, and we'll move on to the main part of the webinar. So just to give you all a, a brief introduction to eLive Innovation, the eLive Innovation Initiative is a separately funded effort aimed at providing funding, training, and community support for creative individuals, innovators, and teams within the academic and technology industries. The primary outputs of the initiative are open solutions uh, aimed at improving the discovery, sharing, consumption, and evaluation of research. So um, the executable research article project is something that eLife Innovation has been working on since 2017. It used to be known as the Reproducible Document Stack Project. Some of you may be more familiar with its name. Um, and the project is developed in collaboration with uh, Stencilla and Substance. The motivation for this work is that uh, we see that while code and data are increasingly important in research, they're often left out of the main narrative of a research paper. This negatively impacts the reproducibility and reusability of the research that's published. So this drives our vision to create an executable research article one that encapsulates usable code and data within the flow of a manuscript. Uh, we hope to deliver progressive enhancement, which means that uh, if you are a casual reader trying to understand if you want to dive further into reading the paper, you'd be able to see a static research article and be able to browse through quite quickly. Um, whereas if you're a deep reader uh, who is uh, you know, looking to interact further with the code and data, that ability is also provided within the research article. Um, the tools that we develop, we hope that they will be future proof. Um, so they should be platform tool and language agnostic. They should be accessible and easy to use by everyone. And ultimately our aim is to encourage the reuse of published research. Um, so since we've now sort of realized that vision, I think it's easiest to show you what, what, what that sort of looked like in, in our minds. Um, just gonna switch over quickly to um, uh, my other screen. So here you'll be able to see um, a executable article that we've recently published. This is by Louis et al. Um, in 2018 as part of the Reproducibility Project Cancer Biology series. Looks like almost a, any other article that you see normally on the eLife website, except when you reach some of the articles, uh, sorry, the, some of the figures. Here you see figure 1b. There's um, blue uh, I icon on the top left. If you click that, you'll be able to see the code that is generating these two bar plots here. Furthermore, what I can do is that I can actually modify this code in the browser. So here I'm going to make a couple of modifications. Um, for those of you who are familiar with uh, R, you can see that I've, you can probably understand that I'm trying to change this code to display a dot plot instead. Now I've clicked run here and you can see that change immediately manifesting um, in the uh, figure. Um, so this is all happening live in the browser. So um, this is actually 
uh, something that we've demoed back in February last year. Uh, since we published that demo, we've uh, received a lot of positive feedback and uh, folks coming to us and asking if they can publish their papers as reproducible, executable documents. And we realized that in order to do that, we need to build a stack of tools, tools that will allow researchers to author their manuscripts with their code and data embedded, tools that will allow us to host these articles and set up the reproducible execution environments that are needed to allow for those library executions and tools for us and any other publishers to accept and publish these executable research articles at scale. While we're moving towards these visions, we strive to develop error in accordance with these three core principles. We commit to working in the open. We're not trying to win any tools race. And the aim is to maximize our reuse of existing open technologies wherever applicable. All of the, all of the tools that we create in turn uh, are created openly and the code base is on GitHub. We aim to communicate and update the community on our uh, developmental progress and milestones and to actively collect feedback and foster collaboration, which is exactly what we're doing here. Um, the second thing is that we also understand that research and tech ecosystems evolve very quickly and hence it is important that the tools we develop are interoperable and future proof so that the infrastructure can be efficiently maintained and users don't have to constantly switch and learn how to use new tools. And finally, by building in the open and keeping our tools modular, we hope that other innovators in the communities can then build on top of our technological innovations. So I'm very happy to say that thanks to the hard work of the Stencilla team and the eLife's technology product and production teams, we're now ready to work with eLife authors. So you all to create and publish uh, executable complements to your published research. Um, so we really want to make sure uh, in the last year and a half, we've really worked hard to make sure that the workflow for authors is as simple as they possibly can be, and that you can do this, compose this error complement with tools that you're already familiar with or working with. So, um, just a simple diagram before we head into a demo of the author's workflow to show you approximately what that looks like. Um, so four very simple steps. Uh, I'll be showing you uh, a, a platform called Stencilla Hub in a moment. So that's a platform where you can take your eLife article URL, uh, link it into a project, and then convert that eLife article into a R Markdown or Jupyter Notebook, um, depending on what to which tools that you're more familiar with. Um, once you've done that conversion, um, you can download that file and add uh, the code chunks that I've shown before uh, into the R Markdown or Jupyter Notebook locally. So now your article is enriched, you can uh, upload that back into Sensilla Hub along with any necessary data files. And basically you're set, you just have to create a snapshot and share that link with the eLife production team. So I think a demo will speak clearer than words. So I'll try and do this live demo now. Um, so we'll see. Um, please, uh, if in, during the demo, if you have any questions, feel free to um, put them in the agenda. So let me just head over to uh, Stencilla Hub. So first thing that you need to do when you uh, go to the Stencilla Hub website, just going back, um, that you need to sign up for an account. So here I'm signed into my account, but it, it should be a pretty intuitive um, to sign up for an account using your email address or uh, ORCID or Google account. Uh, there are plenty of ways to be able to do that. Once you've signed up for an account, um, you'd be able to see a, a project dashboard similar to this one. Um, and the first thing that you'd need to do is to create a new project. So click this new project button going to create a project within the eLife account today for this demo. Um, I'll name it demo. Uh, put a date on it as well. Now click create project and projects have been created. So um, as I said, uh, you need your eLife article. So uh, today with, for this demo, I'd be working with this particular article authored by uh, James Watson and his team. Uh, so you can have a look at this. Let's have a look at this article and, and what it looks like. So 
uh, has an introduction section and the result section has two figures. Um, my aim is to make this figure uh, executable here. Um, it's uh, having accessed and looked at their GitHub repo, it's a R markdown file that they've used. And so that's what I'm gonna work with when I'm trying to make this, uh, art, uh, this figure executable. So taking a note of the article ID here in the URL, this is 43154. What I'm gonna do in my new Stenzilla Hub project is that I would go to sources. So here on the, in the user interface, you can see that it explains that sources are remote files that you can link to uh, your project. So the eLife article in this case is the remote file. To link that, I'll click the new button here uh, from journal eLife. So um, remembering the article number, 43154. Um, the path uh, is um, how the source will be mapped to in the project. So I can put something like article, create this source. So that article has been very quickly pulled into the, fo the, the folder of this um, Stencil Hub project already. You can see this in the file directory. Uh, it's an XML file because that's how eLife stored articles. So uh, it's, a, it's a structured text format. So now I've got this uh, article file in my folder. I can proceed to converting that into an R markdown file, which I'll be doing the enrichment in. So to do that, uh, you point towards this uh, three button with three dots, um, convert to, and then select our markdown. Um, I'll click convert at this point. Just give it a couple of seconds and it's finished. So heading back to uh, the files menu, you'll be able to see that the R markdown file called article.rmd is generated seven seconds ago. Now um, that the conversion has been completed, I can go ahead um, Again, with this three dot uh, button, I can click download here. And now I've saved this R markdown file locally. So let me just quickly switch over to my R studio. So you could see the uh, enrichment. So um, this is something that, uh, uh, this is the file that I've sort of done the previous process before. <laughs> so, um, but this is exactly how the converted R markdown would look like. So you can see the nicely preserved uh, metadata here regarding the author's name and their affiliation and contact details, etc. Be able to scroll past that into the introduction section and then the results. So everything is very nicely preserved. Um, the figure that I would like to modify is figure two, if you remember from the paper. Um, so here you can see that that block says, uh, here this indicates the location of uh, figure two. Um, first, uh, I need to tell uh, Stenzilla that this is uh, not a static figure anymore, but a code chunk. So changing that figure to chunk. And then this is the link to the original uh, image file of the figure. So I'll go ahead and remove that. This is the figure caption title and the figure caption itself. I'll leave that. And then here is where I will insert the code chunk. So as I said, uh, I've browsed through the GitHub repository of this of this paper to find the corresponding code that is needed to generate this um, article. But uh, uh, of course, if you're authoring this paper, you would have those files, uh, you've had access to those files yourselves. So um, this is the code that I found. So um, I'm just gonna actually copy that into the uh, new file. But meanwhile, uh, you can see that I've run this and it actually is the same as the graph that we've seen before. So the figure that we've seen before in the static version of the paper. So um, once that is done, the, let's say you've completed your enrichment. I'll go ahead and save that. 
and then we will go back to the Stencilla Hub environment. So um, let me just, uh, now I will go ahead and upload the enriched R Markdown file that I've just done into this folder that we've created. Choose some files, be able to do that locally. Open that and upload. So now the file has been uploaded and you can see it appearing here. It's called paper dash enriched RMD. So uh, the next thing I would do, uh, this, this code chunk actually has no associated data file, so I didn't need to upload it. Um, the code should run on its own. Uh, I'll create a snapshot. Uh, you might uh, want to make it into a main file so that ah. the project knows which <laughs> ones to serve. Definitely, sorry, I forgot about that. Yeah, okay. so to make that a, a, your main file, uh, what you need to do is to click the dots here again and just click main file. So I'll create a new snapshot. It's now called snapshot two because the last one is snapshot one. Just wait a second. So here's your preview of the uh, executable complement to the original article. You can see that, uh, again, it looks very similar to um, the static version. Except when you reach the uh, figure that we've now uh, made executable, click the I, and um, the code is here. That the code that we've put in is here. So uh, this takes a while but I will give it a go to try and run this document and we'll see if it worked. So uh, when you browse an executable article, um, you have to click the run document button here to be able to reserve that, uh, to start the executable uh, environment that is, you know, powering this executable article. So um, just waiting for it to run, it's, it's a simulation, so it does take a while. Uh, just uh, while we're, we're here <laughs> and we have some time, um, I encourage you to put any questions that you may have into the question and answer section in the open agenda um, and we'd be able to answer that towards the end. So this is actually, once you've completed this snapshot, um, this is the link that you'll be sharing with the Eli production team. So we only need this link to be able to then um, serve this, serve and publish this article on our website. Hopefully that's, so that's completed. Um, again, I hope you recognize the graph that you saw in the, in fact, I can now go back to the original article. Um, this is the graph uh, that was static before. Sorry. And now we have the executable version. Um, the display is not uh, entirely perfect here, but the team's working on it to make it look a bit um, more similar to the, the one in the previous version. And again, um, there's still that ability to be able to edit, edit this code in browser. For example, change some of these uh, simulation parameters and the changes will be reflected in the graph real time. So I'm gonna stop sharing at this point. Um, and this is the end of my demo. Um, and I'll now hand over to Alex to elaborate a bit more on the uh, schematic, uh, the schema, and also the discoverability of your articles and how it relates to error. Thanks, Amy. That was a great demo, and um, thanks for having me here. So I'll start sharing my screen and kind of talk a bit about some of the, you know, to pull back the curtain on some of the technology that's powering uh, this, the executable articles as well as um, you know, the, the work that the ELIF innovation has allowed us to work on. And so uh, for us, the big <laughs> key thing about the, the ERA is that we, we, we see them as um, empowering the authors uh, to, to publish discoverable content and <clears throat> for readers to reuse latest research for their own work since they have access to all the underlying data and the code and 
uh, and the, all the aspects that make a manuscript reproducible. To, oops, sorry. to power that, we worked on two projects. Uh, one is the schema and the other is ENCODA, and they work hand in hand to allow us to, um, first of all, capture all the semantic information about the, the manuscript that has been um, written by the author, whether that's from the, the JATS XML or the R Markdown, and then um, be able to convert that into other formats. And uh, you mentioned, Amy, about um, the, all the work being um, you know, future-proof and uh, being able to be developed further. And so all of our the underlying schema is based on things like um, existing standards, such as uh, schema.org and microdata and JSON-LD. And what this allows us to do is when we see an article and we're trying to convert it from one format to another, we're able to identify all the semantic uh, elements, such as um, <clears throat> you saw um, in, in the conversion that we, we maintain all the list of authors, their contact information, and so on. And that, uh, that means that when you convert, convert from one format to another, we're able to translate those elements. Um, but you know, this process does have some, draw, uh, some limitations in that we capture semantic information and not um, things like you know, what font size is or what color something is. Um, and so to kind of demonstrate a bit what that looks like going from R markdown to HTML is that um, you can see that we have a title, we have um, some text and code chunks, and we, we are able to embed all this information inside the HTML using the microdata um, format. No, sorry, the microdata attributes. So we can see that this, um, this article element conforms to the schema of the article, and then we have a headline, and um, we have a person here who's an author and so on, and the, the reason I think this is exciting for us is that it allows us to um, publish naturally machine readable and discoverable articles. And uh, Google is one big search engine, um, but also other uh, search engines and other uh, programs can parse this data and uh, improve um, discoverability of the articles um, uh, besides the, the published um, journals. So when uh, people are searching for other um, articles to reference in their own work or just uh, getting more organic exposure, um, this is a really great and easy and standards compliant way of doing so. And um, the other thing is, as we said, that the schema.org is very extensible. And so the, the, the schema that we've developed is very focused for um, for research manuscripts and has things like the code chunks and references and citations and so on. Uh, and we're all seeing some um, up, take, uh, uptake of, of the, the schema by other uh, companies uh, such as Hive uh, Review, which is I think a, a peer reviewed uh, platform that Eli has also you know, uh, partnered with. And, um, and lastly, just before I, I start to wrap up is that HTML is just one of the, the formats that we support converting to, and you saw Emmy convert to R Markdown. Um, but we can also convert to PDFs, um, Google Docs, Microsoft Word, and any other uh, formats that the community uh, has a need, need for. And the, the thing that we think differentiates us from other existing solutions is that we, we have methods of embedding and maintaining the reproducibility aspect. So even when you convert to a PDF, we embed the code elements and the source code inside the document so that when you then try to go back to your R markdown or the source format, that information is still preserved. And I think that's uh, really exciting um, for you know, distribution of reproducible articles. Uh, but then, uh, as we were doing user interviews earlier um, on last year, we we found that this workflow was really convenient for gathering feedback from supervisors and managers, you know, people who might want to um, comment on the copy uh, or the text of, of a manuscript, and they want to work, uh, read it in a Microsoft Word document. It's easy to convert your 
source document, uh, such as Jupyter Notebook or R Markdown, into Word, send it to them. They can make textual changes and then send it back to you, and you can convert back to R Markdown and have that con the text uh, preserve the text uh, changes while um, preserving the code as well. So you don't have to copy it, paste across documents, and which uh, I think everyone knows can be very error prone. So I think ultimately uh, for us, the, the open and reproducible research is critical for compressing the time between doing research and then seeing the impact that it has in the field. And um, it's, you know, it's especially, I think, um, critical for the papers that you demonstrated uh, just now, Emmy, where they they include simulations that cannot be captured in the static versions, so, and they're either just static HTML or static print ones, um, where each iteration can lead to different results and different intuitions. So I think that's where I think uh, the reproducible articles um, that can be executed are uh, can have the most uh, impact. Um, I think that's it for me um, as well. If anyone has any questions about any of the process, uh, about uh, how we're handling some of the conversions or the executable aspects, please feel free to um, ask away. Um, and thank you again, Amy. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, so uh, I made a note here to talk a bit about our feature direction. Um, so we're, we've recently launched, um, of course, so we're very excited and we're keeping a, a close eye on sort of the, the, um, the, feed, the, the traffic that we're getting to the articles and also looking at how um, people have been interacting with those articles and, and how they've been playing around with the code. Um, in, the, in, the, in the short foreseeable future, I'd say we are focusing, eLife is primarily focusing on really getting our authors on board. So we really, really need your help and support here uh, to uh, compose uh, errors with, with us and uh, so that we could publish them. And we, are, we have a lot to learn here and say, um, we, the main reason why we'd like to work with all of you um, is because we, the more articles we publish and uh, put, bring through this process, the more we'd be able to you know, iron out the, the process and be able to see how the tool stack co can cope and handle different types of data, different types of workflows and different types of tools that get uh, in integrated into, into the articles. Um, and so this is a very important lesson for us in terms of being able to scale this up further and to improve the, the performance of the tool stack as well. Uh, in the longer run, yeah, we, we're really interested in sort of making this um, uh, towards a point where, you know, folks can come to us and, and uh, be able to submit articles uh, no longer in the PDF or Word format. But that's, of course, a, quite a long journey uh, ahead. Um, so I'd, I'd say that's sort of a, a longer uh, uh, endpoint that we hope to reach. But in the meantime, we're also interested to look at um, how uh, this error tools that can work better together with existing tools that uh, researchers are using in different research domains within the life sciences. Um, again, different sets of data and perhaps data uh, repositories uh, that uh, you're using, or tools that you're using to analyze your data as well, and to really improve, focus on improving the interoperability of the tools um, and to be able to make them work uh, well with uh, researchers in different fields of research that um, uh, eLife is um, publishing in. Uh, Alex, uh, maybe if you can highlight a bit sort of where you see Stencilla going with this. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think for us, the, 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 yes, the, you know, we've come a long way, but we still have a lot to do in terms of uh, improving the workflows and improving the, you know, just how much uh, variance we can handle in the, the manuscripts and the conversion aspects. Um, and the, the, the process of getting an author being able to share their project uh, as fast as possible in a way that can be uh, consumed by readers. I think we're, we have a, a, 
a process for that. But the the thing I think that we really want to refine on is the uh, just the is uh, how uh, how um, the the integration with the published um, with the, the journals works. And so um, being able to have a good um, good workflow from the the start of the authoring process to how it gets published um, and consumed uh, by the masses and trying to maintain the reproducibility and the, um, uh, the, you know all the underlying data and the code uh, is, is is key. And right now there's that manual step of where the author gets to hand it off to eLife, but I think there's uh, improvements that can be made in, in that uh, process too. Fantastic. Um, so yeah, just, just to sort of end this section, um, just to bring your attention back to sort of the, the immediate call to action, let's say. Uh, yeah, you have this link on the screen right now uh, that will lead you to the original uh, launch article that we've published. Um, if you're an eLife author and you're interested in um, publishing an error with us, please fill out this form that you can reach by the button here. So click this and you get to a form where um, you'll be able to uh, give, uh, indicate your interest and we'll follow up with that um, as soon as we possibly can and uh, bring you through the process. And um, here are contact details if you have any further questions. We do have a bi-monthly, sorry, every two month newsletter uh, <laughs> that will uh, bring you the latest updates and developments on the tool stack. So if you're interested in keeping up with our latest development, please do sign up for it using this URL right here. Um, and of course, uh, our websites, Twitter accounts and email addresses, we're always uh, interested and uh, would love to hear your thoughts. So uh, thank you very much. At this point, we'll move on to the questions. So I th thank you very much for all of your questions in the agenda doc, um, and we'll try and get through as many as we possibly can in the next sort of 20 minutes or so. Um, all right, I'll take it from the top, <laughs> I believe. Um, I, I actually uh, just, um, so yeah, just a reminder, you could also use the raise your hand button in the um, uh, Zoom webinar control panel. Um, and we'll be able to see that and then mute you as well if you do want to ask um, any questions uh, verbally. And also do put them in the chat box in the Zoom so that we could see them and be able to address them as well. Um, so yeah, taking it from the top. Um, we have a question on open source tools. So I mentioned that Toolstack is entirely open source and the code base is on GitHub. Uh, so they do use, at least from eLife, we do use open source license. Um, Alex, I think Stensilla, it's Apache v2, quick one. That's correct, yes. GitHub repos. I put the links to the GitHub repos, uh, sorry, not repos, but the, the organization uh, pages in the, um, in the agenda so you can access it there and have a look. Um, we do really encourage contributions from everyone, um, if you can. So um, uh, there, there are many ways that you can do this. You can, you know, if, if it's something that, uh, uh, you know, you like there's, there's a bug or anything, if you're familiar with GitHub issues, that would be super helpful. Um, uh, sort of organizational collaborations, uh, do email us and I think we can, that's sort of the, best way to move forward for us. Uh, Alex, maybe do you, on the Sensilla side, maybe do you have anything mm -hmm. to add? Yeah, I think for us, it's also um, getting our tools um, ex exposed to as many different um, inputs as possible. So different uh, structured documents, different uh, file formats, and just um, identifying uh, any edge cases that might exist. Um, I think that is extremely useful for us. And so even if they aren't technical uh, contributions in terms of, you know, code pull requests, just um, bug, um, um, bug reports and things like that are, are equally helpful for us. Thank you. Um, we do have a raised hand. Uh, Michael uh, von Papan, sorry, I'm going to get <laughs> the pronunciation wrong, uh, but I'll, I'm going to unmute you and you can ask your question directly. 
Michael, where you know, you can speak now. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Hi. Yeah. So thank you very much for for this uh, great en endeavor that you're going to make papers more interactive and reproducible. I really like that a lot, and I think that will benefit uh, a lot of of science actually. Um, but it's it's a very large endeavor, I think. So um, I myself, I'm I'm working for fast genomics, where we are trying not only to provide interactive publications, but basically the complete data analysis pipeline. Um, and I wonder if you're also aiming for long term to go in that direction, maybe to make the complete project uh, reproducible. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the question. Um, we, yeah, I, I wouldn't say we've, we've actually made a decision on that. Uh, we, we definitely interested. Uh, at the same time, you know, we want to at least I, I speak for for Eli here that we you know we we are a journal and so we're focusing on sort of the consumption of that research. Um, of course, the complete reproducibility would mean be able to take raw data and uh, see all the workflows, the pipelines, and code that take that raw data all the way to the published figure. Um, it'd be great to be able to do that, but we also are very keen to keep in mind. Um, sort of what users want when they read the paper and how they would potentially interact with the paper. So if we do, you know, if, if there is, a dem if we see our readers really wanting that reproducibility and, and, and want to interact with those workflows within the browser on the eLife website, we'd love to be able to explore this. I mean, we'd, we'd love to be able to explore this anyway. <laughs> but but I, I think that for, for us to, you know, be able to prioritize that. So we, need, we definitely, as you said, it's a large endeavor. We need to prioritize our next steps and to be able to figure out what would most benefit our readers and our authors. And so um, to be able to do that, uh, we'd, we'd be uh, probably conducting, you know, some, some research and we definitely want to uh, hear from, from, you know, our communities to see how and what they'd like to see in the near future. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, so if I can just shortly follow up. So um, our users, they are working in, in this reproducible environment that we are providing. So for them, it would be interesting to go the other direction, not from the paper to the Jupyter notebook, but uh, from the Jupyter notebook to the paper. Uh, do you also provide something uh, to do that? Um, Alex, do you want to jump in here and see? Yeah. Sure. I, I think the, the, the workflow that Amy demonstrated is, um, I think, the, the first step in that. They're taking the already reviewed um, articles and uh, converting them into executable ones. There is no reason why you couldn't go straight from the, the Jupyter notebook uh, to an article. Um, and, you know, like um, that's just the second half of the process that Amy demonstrated. Um, to, to kind of, if I may backtrack a bit about the reproducibility of the whole project, I think that is um, definitely something that Stensoa is looking at, uh, in that right now we have um, the, all the, the ERA articles that get published, they run inside um, Docker uh, containers that, are, uh, that um, can be specific for the project. Um, and we, we're trying to simplify the, the process for uh, authors to generate the, the reproducible uh, containers with all the dependencies and things like that. So um, I think there is a trajectory where we are aiming to provide reproducibility for the, the complete project. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you for the question. Um, before I uh, allow the next um, uh, hand that is raised, I want to jump to one of the ones that we have on the agenda. Um, so does an error at the moment replace a research article that has been made executable or is an error an article with a separate DOI? At the moment, it is a complement to the published article. Uh, it doesn't have a DOI. So the DOI is with the original article. So uh, at the moment, an error is not citable, but if you would you know, like that to change, please let us know. Um, we see how, what we can do about it in the future. Uh, Alex, do you have anything to add on that front? 
Um, no, but um, providing, um, I think, providing DOIs for the snapshots, which uh, just to kind of expand on our um, immutable version copies of the entire project. So when uh, Amy clicked the, the snapshot button, we download and capture uh, the, the files as they are at that point in time. And so we are, <clears throat> sorry, we are looking at uh, providing DOIs for those snapshots, but it's, it's again, something that's on the roadmap, but we need more user input. Sounds great, thanks, Alex. Uh, we'll now move to, uh, uh, we see a raised hand from Shalin. So I'll, uh, I'll now unmute you and allow you to talk. Hi. <clears throat> Yeah, this is a great initiative, um, and uh, I think the, the the demand is is very high. Um, I had uh, a specific question about image analysis pipelines, and I think it partially got answered uh, by Alex that uh, if if the if your analysis pipeline has custom tools uh, for image analysis, it doesn't seem that the current workflow will support the support making that type of article an executable article. We'll have to wait. Um, will we have to wait till the Docker, uh, the feature of using the Docker containers uh, in your in your article is available? Or, yes, yeah, so in short, the question is if, if the article has significant uh, amount of custom code at this point, um, let's have our own GitHub code, can we turn that type of article into an ERA? Or should will we need to wait till the Docker functionality is available. Uh, I can answer this. And right now, I think uh, it's our own immediate roadmap. So in the very near future, we are um, trying to introduce support for providing a custom Docker file, which you can uh, state uh, all the dependencies and things that you need um, manually. And I don't think that should uh, take us very long. It's just something that we haven't exposed in the user interface or the, the product yet. But um, if you would like to sign up to Stencilla, we are looking for um, early adopter projects um, to work and collaborate with um, on uh, testing these uh, features. So it might be a good fit um, for us to collaborate on together um, on this, if you'd like. That sounds excellent. That's great. Um, and I have one uh, follow-up question um, to uh, to the collaboration on the topic of collaboration. So the uh, the repositories you have, um, do you uh, anticipate other institutions uh, other than Stencilla um, um, contributing significantly um, uh, uh, to this project? And I'm thinking of so I work for Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. And um, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, for example, supports BioArchive, um, and Allen Institute and other institutes are are interested in uh, in uh, you know advancing the the pace of publication and reproducibility of uh, research and, and exposing the data. Um, what's your uh, philosophy behind the collaboration? Are you looking for collaboration initially only from authors, or um, or also tool builders, or in terms of timing? Um, when should the authors uh, be in touch with you? When should the tool builders be in touch with you? Um, thanks for the question. I, I can I can be, answer the first part of this. Uh, I mean, we're 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 open for collaboration now, and honestly, this is a good time for technologists as well as authors to get in touch and let us know what you think. Um, so we're actively trying to map out sort of what to do next. So. Uh, whether you have, you know, working, you are working on a tool that could be potentially compatible, uh, and interoperable with with Era and Stencilla, um, just let us know. Send us an email, and we'd be happy to follow up on that. Thank you, uh, Alex. Anything to add? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, it, except that we are also very open to contributions and uh, engaging dialogue with uh, future directions and, um, and you know partnering with uh, people who are interested in expanding this work so yeah please reach out thank you thank, you. thank, thank you. you okay i'm gonna go ahead and um answer a couple more questions off the agenda um so uh there was a related question to the doi question where um how should authors initiate a dialogue for error 
after the article is published or during the initial submission or either mode. Um, I'd say uh, in the initial submission, uh, you could indicate that you are interested in having an error component to your published article when it's eventually accepted and published. Uh, that wouldn't uh, influence, you know, any of the editorial processes. Um, so the, the, the peer review and uh, production is in, independent from the error publishing process. But equally, if you already have a published article, it doesn't matter how old it is, as long as it's on eLife, um, we'd love to hear from you if you are interested in publishing an error. Um, and uh, the next question uh, is on MATLAB. So um, there are many scientists using MATLAB for data analysis and open source toolboxes are built on MATLAB. Um, and similar question is um, whether the error would be compatible with any proprietary data analytics software. Um, do you want to have a go, Alex? Uh, I can't speak for MATLAB since I don't have too much experience with it or familiarity with it. Um, I will say that if, if it can be, you know, installed on a Docker image and create an environment for it, then we should be able to support it. But um, I think that's as far as my knowledge on this matter goes. Sorry. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, I'd say um, at the moment, unfortunately, we don't support it for now. Uh, we prioritize uh, integration and interoperability with open source language and tools. Um, so, but if there is, yeah, uh, we're, we're not quite sure how to work around it yet, to be honest, if it's a proprietary stack. Um, but if there is a demand, we are happy to uh, have a conversation, maybe look into it. Um, can't promise anything at this point, but definitely do let us know if that's something that you'd like to see. Um, okay, um, more questions on the agenda. Um, let's say in the future where most articles are executable, what do you envision a research communications world to look like and what directions would error lead to? Thank you for the question. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I, this is, yeah, again, me personally, I guess, um, I, yeah, we, at eLife, we'd like to see um, that era really um, promotes reuse of research, uh, published research, that people, because readers could uh, gain further understanding into the research that's published, the method that's been used, the data that's been uh, used in, in the research, um, they'd be, uh, you know, more easily, I'd say, and, and definitely sort of quicker, um, they, they'd be able to reuse other people's methods more easily as well. And that's exactly what we want to see. We wanted to see, you know, less reinventing the wheel per se, but more sort of building on top of each other's work meaningfully and um, giving credit to others as well. So I think that's, that's sort of where we'd like to see it. Um, I'm aware of more sort of more ambitious endeavors in terms of collaborative code editing and that sort of thing. And um, I think, you know, that's really like, again, being interested in innovation and research communication, I'd like to see that happening in the future. Um, Alex? Yeah, I think uh, it, it's, it's many of the same aspects, you know, it's uh, like you can't really have a, a whole co a conversation if you're only seeing half of the picture, right? And, and um, just get getting exposure and shining light on, on the underlying uh, the works uh, that power the, the, the insights and the research is, I think, what, what is exciting for me personally. So. Awesome. Thank you for asking that. <laughs> um, next question. Um, there seems to be a huge scalability challenge. If many articles are published this way, it will require quite a significant amount of computing power. I'm guessing that the solution necessary will be both, we'll have both a technical and editorial site. Um, could you share thoughts you already have on this, please? Um, even though I guess it's a work in progress. Um, yeah, thank you. I think we definitely have thought about this. <laughs> in fact, it's, it's a very nice problem to have if we have a lot of people browsing the articles and using it and running it. Um, I think that's, that's, that's the problem that we'd like to have at this point. Um, it is definitely, especially on the editorial side, it's definitely a challenge to be able to process and produce that many articles. Um, 
but um, yeah, we're exploring. I think I think Alex, you may be able to elaborate on this a bit better. Um, yeah, we're we're definitely interested in sort of collaborations, looking at how we can um, um, dis like. Uh, so you can you can theoretically take the tool stack that we have ready and run your own instance of Sensilla Hub and then use your own computer resources, right? So it doesn't have to go through eLife. So I think that's something that we are interested in and maybe Sensilla too. Yeah, so as you said, you know, like all our work is open source. So there's uh, nothing really stopping them from going and spinning up their own Sensilla Hub and compute resources. Uh, for us, uh, everything is done in a scalable manner. So, you know, whatever um, resources that uh, the cloud computing giants of, you know, Amazon, Google, and them, they have to offer, I think, the, the financial constraints are the only limiting resource uh, for us to be able to handle the, the load. But as you said, you know, that's a, that's a good problem for us to have, and it's something that we can tackle. Mm -hmm. But on a purely technical level, I think we should be able to address it, uh, or we are already in a place to to handle it. Um, yeah. And yeah, I think okay. there's a, a sorry, just a, <laughs> to wrap up. I think there's a the, the I think for me the more interesting question is what does the, the editorial and the review process look like when there's extra information such as you know the technical competency needed to review the source code and uh, and all these other aspects so yeah definitely i cannot agree more um i think i think that would be sort of the next sort of interesting challenge within this this bigger roadmap and one that we're definitely very interested to solve um thank you for for the question um hope you, we've answered it uh just scrolling down the agenda um there is question who can post error articles does your article need to be published before hand in another magazine or are you prime the primary source to publish are the authors the only one authorized to make the error or can anyone that knows how to make the code publish it that's a really really good question um so at the moment uh, i think us elife is the sort of the only one who is offering this service via sensor uh so the error surface so you do have to be an eLife author at the moment to be able to publish an error on the eLife website, if that makes sense. Um, you can just use Stencilla Hub to enrich any articles that you like and share the snapshot with anyone that you like. Um, I think that's a short answer to, to the question where whether anyone is able to produce an error. So the answer is yes. Um, it wouldn't end up on the eLife website unless probably when we have um, consent, uh, consent from the authors, or the original authors, but nevertheless, you're welcome to take articles and make them executable and share the snapshot with everyone. And if you do do that, do share it with us. We'd like to know. Um, Alex? Yeah, uh, I think just as a, a bit of a caveat, uh, while we're in this early stages, uh, we have limited um, the onboarding. So when you do sign up, you will be placed on a waiting list. And uh, we we progress, uh, sorry, we uh, periodically uh, invite users to be able to create projects and um, make their own uh, era articles. Um, but uh, uh, for now, the, the hub is only, you know, you're only able to make full use of the hub if you're invited as a collaborator on an existing project where you can add documents and uh, do other things. Or um, if you if you um, get invited to, to the full, uh, full featured, um, I guess, tier. Um, but, um, you know, as I said, please uh, don't let this put you off on signing up because we are adding people all the time. And uh, if you if you think you have a great project that would be a good fit for for these sorts of um, art uh, these sorts of uh, you know papers, please uh, sign up and send us a message using uh, either the intercom button on the bottom right of the, the hub or an email, and uh, we can uh, start you know we can um, upgrade the accounts um, fast. Awesome, thank you. Um, uh, we have two minutes. We have one last question. <laughs> Since we're sure readers are viewing these on the web, do we have plans to allow interactive figures, for example, Plotly or JavaScript D3? 
uh, I'll let Alex answer this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, yeah. Uh, so we we had early support for JavaScript, but uh, it's been removed uh, temporarily, and that's why we focus on R and uh, Python. But um, I think, as you said, you know, like the the interactivity for us is just a one way of developing intuition uh, for the underlying concepts and providing the more interactive widgets and um, you know, user interfaces for for developing that intuition is something that is very important to me uh, at least. And um, we are working on uh, we have you know we've had conversations about developing custom uh, interfaces for you know the main specific. Uh, areas such as you know ability to explore proteins or in different types of um, enzymes and things like that. So um, yeah, it's it's something that is very very interesting to us, but nothing, um, no immediate plans uh, just yet. Thank you. All right, we're coming to the end of the hour. Thank you very much once again for all of you, to all of you who are joining us, and uh, for all your wonderful questions. Um, if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us via any of these channels. We're more than happy to hear uh, your thoughts and your ideas and your feedback on the work that we're doing. Uh, thank you very much once again for joining us. And thank you, Alex and Anya, and uh, hope to see you all soon. Thanks for running this, Emmy, and thanks for everyone uh, for joining. Thank you. Bye. Bye.